Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Foresight's Existential Hope Day, uh, the first of its kind. Uh, thank you so, so much for joining. Uh, I'm really, really, really delighted to re-meet and meet so many new faces that I've seen on Zoom. And I, yeah, I'm also really excited for you all to meet each other because you're different kind of like parts of the Foresight community. Um, and first, maybe just we're going to do a bunch of introductions and like, you know, more like uh, mingling later, but I just want to see maybe a show of hands uh, of like, uh, who here is actually from the Bay Area? If you could give me, whoa, okay. Who here is from the US? So like traveled from the US. Who here traveled internationally? Okay, cool. Wow, wow. this is wonderful. Wow. So we have like uh, a bit a bit of all, uh, which is I think the, the best mix. Um, and, and so I hope to meet uh, and, and, and I hope for you guys to make many friends that you can collaborate with online and, and in person. Uh, and then second question, how many Foresight events have you been to? Have you been to at least one before? Okay, have you been to two? Three? How many have you been to, Christine? All of them. All of them. <laughs> since 1986, yeah. and I'm sure some other people could raise their hand for that as well. I unfortunately can't for my time, but okay, wonderful. Um, thanks a lot for coming and for making um, yeah, yeah, all this way here. Really, really, really appreciate it. Um, uh, one more question. Who here feels rather doomy about the future right now? You may say so. It's okay. It's safe. It's a safe space. Who here feels pretty optimistic about the future right now? Okay, good. Uh, let's see if we can change some minds either way and uh, um, uh, or at least, you know, nevertheless, even though probabilities are too much high, at least push for positive futures even in the face of that. Um, so that's a little bit like what we're hoping to do here. Uh, so it's not just like Pollyannishly thinking everything's going to be great, uh, but it's a little bit more like, you know, a realistic assessment of where we are and where, uh, how nevertheless, given all the factors that have occurred over the past few months um, and before, how can we nevertheless make great futures more likely? Uh, okay, wonderful. So I think there's no better ways to kind of like lay out these two trajectories than with two quotes that I often use, but I think they're like really nevertheless very prescient. So I think from this moment in time where we are right now, one future seems scarily likely, and that's uh, by no uh, better person exemplified than Friedrich Nietzsche. And he said, in some remote corner of the universe, poured out and glittering in innumerable solar systems, there once was a star on which clever animals invented knowledge. That was the highest and most mendacious minute of world history. Yet only a minute. After nature had drawn a few breaths, the star grew old and the clever animals had to die. There have been eternities when it did not exist and when it's done for again, nothing will have happened. That's like one perspective, I think, uh, on the long-term future. And I think that's one that, you know, like is definitely like on my mind a lot. Here's another one. And I think it's like at least possible from where we're standing right now. And it's from Eric Drexler, uh, back in Engines of Creation, which is the book that led to Foresight's form, uh, for formation a, a long, long time ago. And he said, whether anyone else is out there or not, we are on our way. Expansion will proceed if we survive because we're part of a living system and life tends to spread. Pioneers will move outward into worlds without end. Others will remain behind, building settled cultures throughout the aces of space. Where goals change and complexity rules, limits need not bind us. New technologies will nurture new arts and new arts will bring new standard. The world of brute matter offers room for great but limited growth. The world of mind and pattern, though, holds room for endless evolution of ch and change. The possible seems room enough. I think both of these, um, you know, we can hold in our head right now. Both of these seem at least possible trajectories for the future. And I think today we will be trying to think a little bit about like how to navigate, uh, you know, like between these trajectories and hopefully uh, shoot a little bit more, more in the direction uh, of the latter. And so I'm really, really happy to have all of you guys uh, to do this with, and especially you guys. Um, and I think it's going to be hopefully really fun, uh, but also inspiring and, and hopefully productive day. So thanks everyone uh, for showing up. Um, I want to, like Beatrice will tell you a little bit more about Existential Hope uh, later and about the projects that we have going on in there. But we have literally the originator of the term here, which I'm so delighted and like honored to have you here for. Like um, the paper Existential Hope, which Toby Ode uh, and Owen Cotton Barrett wrote a few years ago, really like lit a fire in me. And I think uh, since then I've been like vicariously collecting positive resources about the long-term future on the page Existential Hope in different categories. And so I really welcome you to contribute to this library of Existential Hope and basically just trying to onboard folks and show them that positive futures are possible. 
We also have this Existential Hope podcast in which we interview people with a positive vision of the future on like how that could look like. We ask them very concrete questions uh, about how their technology and science and tech that they're working on could get us there. And then we create scenarios around them. And so I'm hoping that we get a little bit into scenario building later as well. And a few of you have already done so at Vision Weekend, so take the others by the hand. But that will be led by Beatrice uh, later today. And so we have uh, Beatrice here who will be leading the Existential Hope Workshop. She's our COO. We have Neve Perrin here who's leading our fellowship in many of our programs. We have Viv here who will be helping you with all event logistics and has been a wonderful collaborator. We have Lydia here in the back uh, who you can also chat to about a bunch of foresight projects and who will be manning our metaverse gallery or womening our metaverse gallery later. Um, then we have Christine, the co-founder of Foresight and me, uh, I'm currently running it. We have lots of other collaborators uh, around the world that are not currently here, but I'm hoping that eventually you get them to meet. And so I want to tell you just briefly what Foresight is for those of you who don't know, and then we'll jump right into uh, the fireside chat. So Foresight Institute is an organization that was established in 1986 by Christine Peterson and Eric Drexler together, and is really focused on advancing technologies for the long-term benefit of life. And so we do this, we focus specifically on these niche areas that like legacy institutions don't really care about yet or have no space really uh, to like push progress in. And so those are like transdisciplinary collaborations, very ambitious projects, very early stage projects, uh, more niche areas where people don't quite go yet. And we particularly try to make them go well for the future. We have a few focus areas. Molecular machines and molecular nanotechnology is the one that we got founded on. So how can we really build with better and better precision from the bottom up um, uh, and have better materials uh, on, uh, on the long run that can lead to all kinds of wonderful things like longevity, space exploration, and so forth. We have this intelligent corporation track, which is a more decentralized cryptography computing focus track that has a lot of, like I think, wonderful applications also for AI safety. We have this newer technology and uh, a track that really focuses on like more the long-term stuff, from, uh, all the way from BCIs to whole brain emulations, which we have a workshop with Andrew Sa Sandberg on later this year. We have the longevity in biotech uh, group, uh, and that's really focused on like more kind of like, let's say, niche approaches in the longevity in biotech area, all the way from partial reprogramming to biostasis. Uh, and then the space track, which is led by Creon over here, and which we're trying to grow a little bit of a community around um, more the outlandish, like, uh, and nevertheless quite ambitious space projects. The existential hope layer is really the layer with which we um, try to push for differential technology development in these areas. Who here knows what that term means? Okay, so for those who don't, uh, you'll be hearing a lot about this today, but it's basically, there's probably ways in which we can uh, accelerate safety and security enhancing technologies over technologies uh, that um, may be more dangerous first. And so it's a very positive approach to technology development. It's not just saying, okay, we need to stop everything right now, but it's saying there's probably better things we could be doing first. For me, for example, computer security seems like one of them uh, in particular, also for AI safety potentially. Anyway, how do we do all of this stuff? We have seminars in all of these areas. So each of these groups has uh, a long-standing seminar group now for a few years in which like about 150 to 400 folks meet for monthly seminars. Who here is in one of our seminar groups? So who joins these virtual seminars every once in a while? Cool, great. Okay, so uh, you're in that bucket, especially I think useful for people who are not in the Bay Area and who want to stay up to date on what's happening in their technological area. We have a lot of prizes and fellowships in each of these categories too. So who here is or has been a Foresight Fellow? Please raise your hand. Wonderful. Well, and we're really delighted to have you here and hoping to introduce you uh, to more folks in the community as well later. And then each of these areas that I mentioned also has in-person events. And so we have a variety of Existential Hope Days, the first one for us this year, but we have a variety of other uh, workshops too. We will have here a big Longevity Frontiers workshop where we really look at like what's happening at the frontiers in longevity technology and how can we advance these frontiers. Then we have the whole brain emulation workshop with Anders Sandberg in Oxford. We have a space workshop uh, that will be chaired by Creon over here. And we have this intelligent cooperation workshop, which looks more at the like really like more uh, multi-agent systems and how they can, uh, they can contribute to AI alignment. And finally, the Fawcett uh, Molecular Machine System Design Workshop again here later this year. So if any of these pique your interest and you're not already attending one of them, or who's attending already one of these workshops? Okay, a few of you already, great. If you, oh, any one of them piques your interest, there's application forms out there. Uh, and then we have the Vision Weekend at the end of the year coming up. So we have this mix of like ecosystem building through a variety of virtual groups, um, uh, prizes, fellowships, uh, in-person workshops, 
um, uh, and, and then things like this, which are more like the kind of like hope setting uh, narratives uh, that we have throughout the day. Uh, one thing, I, project I just want to point to you because I often get asked about it, are our tech trees. And so I think for often people that are perhaps like new to science and technologies, they often ask me like, hey, how can I meaningfully contribute? to the field of, let's say, longevity. And I'm like, I'm not the person you should be talking to here. But uh, we have been building over the, uh, you know, really like past year, um, these technology trees, where we basically go from the kind of final goals of these individual fields to the previous capabilities that are required, um, uh, to uh, uh, capabilities that would have to be in place before that. And, and we map different actors onto different, uh, onto different areas, including different open challenges that we then give prizes and bounties uh, for writing um, po um, potential po um, solution proposals for. These technology trees exist for all of our areas. So if you're interested in more of this like meta-analysis of that space that you're in, I welcome you to check those out. Ideally, what we're hoping to do is also contribute a little bit more differential technology nodes in these areas, so specifically highlighting the types of areas that we think are really useful uh, to build in first. Another project I briefly want to talk to you about in our Foresight X category is one thing that personally gets me very excited. Uh, it's a book, Gaming the Future, that we wrote with many uh, folks in our intelligent cooperation group together. It exists as a physical book right here if you're interested in, uh, in, uh, in reading it, but it also has a Substack book which has lots of different videos from people that were contributing um, uh, to, to the book at the time. And for that, I think it's interesting to note that this is more like a kind of like meta layer of how can we think about positive societal technology development um, according to three lenses. The first lens is what are technologies that can improve cooperation across humans? Um, and so there's a bunch of new technologies out there right now. Uh, the second lens is what are technologies that can improve defense against all of the existential risks that we're worried about? And the third layer is how can we do both cooperation and defense in light of AI? Um, and so we have this very like kind of like more systems approach uh, to cooperation. If you're more interested in diving in any of these individual uh, chapters, I really welcome you to check them out. They're all um, yeah free on uh, free online as a Substack book. They all have videos of like specific pro project presentations that we had uh, in seminars uh, in these specific tracks. They all like rely a little bit on this notion of like maybe we can get to something that looks a bit like a parade utopia, a term developed by Mark Miller, who is one of our senior fellows. We wrote the book with and Eric Drexler together a long, long time ago. But we really try to like um, kind of like highlight a few technologies. For example, this one, prediction markets. This is a prediction market that was run by Robin Hansen at one of our 1999 member gatherings in person where people sent checks to our offices. Um, and now there's obviously wonderful prediction um, uh, processes out there, including forecasting platforms. Anthony here has like uh, actually like founded one, uh, Metaculus, which is like totally wonderful in which Gaia will be giving a presentation on later who's uh, also around. So yeah, actually, like there's really wonderful stuff that we can already do to just improve human cooperation. Um, there's a lot of like split contract and contract work in there as well. So if you're interested in specific technologies that can improve human cooperation, I welcome you to check out this chapter. Now, we also need to really think about defense. And I think here in this defense chapter, we highlight this kind of dichotomy that we are all worried about kind of technological uh, progress speeding up to the extent that an, a smaller number of actors can kill a larger number of actors. So like with biotech getting much more democratized, like we may have like really, really, really bad biotech risk, uh, like in our near term future, the same holds for true, true for AI. And oftentimes I think the solutions that we come up with are very like government driven or sometimes even top down and like favor something like, you know, like maybe top down surveillance of all existing labs. And we're basically like trying to explore in this chapter, is there a third solution where we can have like a really large scale technological development while also having a decentralized approach to monitoring. So we discuss encrypted surveillance, like bottom up surveillance uh, and so forth, which are all um, kind of like ideas where there's now product development in them as well. So if you're more interested in this kind of like defense approach to civilization and like how we can defend against uh, risk, um, uh, against existential risk in perhaps a more decentralized way, this chapter is for you. And finally, the last one is the big one on welcoming new players, welcoming artificial intelligences into the game uh, that we're playing. And so here we're laying out like a more decentralized cooperation fabric uh, that allows for both humans and AIs and ultimately AIs and AIs uh, to cooperate in a more principal agent alignment setting, I would say. Um, this uh, book is wildly inspired by Mark Miller's work, uh, who is not joining us today, but uh, if you ever get a chance to talk to him, he is one of the lightest lights I think that, uh, uh, that I've had a chance to collaborate with. 
he's really wonderful um, and uh, and Christine uh, and Christine and I and so if you're interested in learning more about these ideas we basically just set out to bring a philosophical coding on like what are the large three largest biggest problem human cooperation human like defense against risk and human AI cooperation and then we try to highlight a few uh, specific topic areas that we are particularly excited about so maybe just to sum things up you know I think at Foresight we're really trying to push for this more like we have this existential project with, with which we do a bit of like vision setting then within Foresight we mostly really focus on this more differential approach of, to, to science and technology development by having these different clusters and fellowships and prizes and workshop and then uh, like the book is more like kind of our philosophical approach of like on a meta layer what could humans do right now uh, to like yeah make civilization have better prospects today just a few words on the agenda um, we have a very packed day and I'm hoping that you get to interact a lot with each other rather than just in this plenary setting. We have very, very short fireside chats for a reason because they're really there mostly to like tickle your mind a little bit before we then hop into the other parts. So we're now already four minutes uh, into the fireside chat, so I'll keep this brief. But we have one fireside chat with humans that we feel like have really, really wonderful things to contribute to the long-term future, just to highlight a few ideas for you of things that you maybe uh, have percolating through your minds. Then we have a section on meeting your favorite keynote speaker, which is also break. So we will be welcoming you out there. You can get some coffee. We welcome all of you guys to stand around the window so people can chat you up uh, if you're so inclined. Then we're gonna have a second round uh, of fireside chats also focused on positive approaches to the long-term future. And then we have the same, and then we have a, a row of lightning talks and uh, that were brief kind of like individual inputs on like different people working on wonderful um, science and tech uh, bids that we think uh, could elevate the future. Again, we have a meet your favorite keynote speaker session outside. Then we have a huge long lunch. So you can really get to chat and decompress. We're gonna have a walk on the rooftop garden and I think it's during the time when the weather is good. So let's see, um, and a group photo. And then Beatrice will take over and we're gonna get into the work part of today, which is scenario planning. We didn't just come here to like, you know, kind of like babble about the future, but like we really wanna take those fireside chats as little ins inspiration points. Feel free to take notes. What we wanna do later during the workshop session is actually creating existential hope scenarios for different science and tech areas that you're working on or other areas that you think are important. And those can be inspired by the fireside chats She'll be talking a lot more about the existential hope scenario equation, but we really would love for you guys to come up with concrete existential hope scenarios for your area of choice and expertise, uh, a way to get there, uh, and maybe a nice AI-generated art piece at the end to tie things up. We'll then have presentations out here, so you guys can all come on stage, and then we'll be closing with networking and mentorship hours. We're gonna have a VR metaverse gallery of our fellows here. Uh, we're gonna have a scent workshop from the Qualia Research Institute folks. Uh, and then uh, afterwards, we invite our speakers and sponsors uh, to stay from five to eight and our fellows for a smaller gathering afterwards. If you have any questions throughout the day, feel free to just find me. I'm always delighted to speak. Um, and I will uh, demonstrate that by now joining the panel and asking the first fireside uh, chat panel a few questions. So thanks everyone and welcome to the first panel. All right, well, thank you so, so much for joining, first of all. Like, I'm so delighted to have this panel here. Will and Anna are filling in for Tamara Winter, and uh, she does have an amazing presence, so there will be two of them filling in for her. Uh, you'll be realizing in a second why I picked them. They do fantastic, wonderful work. Um, okay, so I do want to do a really rapid fire round. Instead of me introducing you, I think you can do that better. Like, just say very briefly, who are you? What are you working on? In a few sentences, so people, for, for anyone who may not know you, get a better understanding. Robin, who are you? I'm an associate professor of economics at George Mason University. I have an affiliation at the Future of Humanity Institute. Uh, I've had a long career doing a lot of different things, hard to summarize it. I did prediction markets. I've done institution design of many other sorts. I have a book called The Age of M on brain emulation futures, a book called The Elephant in the Brain on basically the psychology of why you don't know why you do things. And the last couple of years, I did a thing on grabby aliens. And in the last few months, I've been working on the sacred, and that's enough. Wonderful. Yes, the sacred. The sacred. The sacred, the sacred yes. he gave a presentation on that at our previous workshop. Also, if you want to throw a note in on like, how did you get to be the person you are, feel free to do so. Hi. I have no idea. Oh. <laughs> Robin is really unique. I can't imagine how you produced this. So. Yeah. No idea. Good job. Good job, Robin. 
Um, I'm Christine Peterson. As Alison mentioned, I'm co-founder of Foresight Institute. Um, I'm interested in all of the topics we cover and um, try to be especially active in the longevity area and intelligent cooperation. I'm co-writing co this book with Allison and Mark. Um, my main role now is connecting. So if you need connections and you're a Foresight member, I'm here for you, especially if you're a fellow. Um, I do a lot of mentoring for the fellows. So uh, whatever you need, reach out. I've been around a long time. I know a lot of people. I can attest she's an incredible matchmaker. Take advantage. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, Toby Ord. Uh, I've uh, always been interested in the, the biggest picture questions facing humanity uh, and what we can do about them. Uh, and I've tried to, I mean, like a lot of people here actually, uh, and I've been trying to, uh, to work on this in, in my life. Uh, I'm a philosopher by, by trade, I also did a lot of science stuff as well. Uh, and that's something where normally we're not allowed to really ask the big picture questions. You might think that we do, but we tend to ask the most foundational questions or something, which is different. Um, and uh, so I you know, got really interested in global poverty uh, as one of the big picture things, challenges facing humanity. Uh, that led to starting Giving What We Can uh, and, uh, and uh, helping to found the effective altruism uh, movement. Uh, and then I also got very interested, uh, particularly through uh, Nick Bostrom in Oxford, uh, in existential risk. Uh, and so I've been uh, uh, focusing on existential risk more recently, uh, and also a kind of slightly wider set of things uh, under the, the heading of long-termism about what are some other ways that, as well as ensuring the safety of humanity, what are other ways that we can affect the, the very long-term future and have uh, uh, truly uh, vast effects on the, the future value that might be achieved. Hi, uh, my name is Anna Yelizarova. Um, my background is. Can you in the back? Should we be speaking up? Sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. My name is Anna Yelizarova, and uh, my background is in computer science and communication. Uh, I work primarily in the AI space, and I'm at a nonprofit called the Future of Life Institute. Uh, we do a lot of policy work and advocacy around um, the safe development of AI and um, a lot of grant making as well in the space. But uh, lately, we've been leaning more into this ex-hope um, thread, and uh, we'll be doing more of what we call flourishing futures. So I work on a few projects in that space as well. And uh, just last year, we ran, or I guess I helped lead this uh, world building contest where we got people from all around the world to, in a lot of detail, workshop these possible futures with a set of constraints. And it's been completely amazing. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited for all the potential collaborations with Foresight. And um, yeah, we're thinking a lot on the same uh, kind of same brainwave. Yeah. So I, I'm Will Zhang. Um, I've been working for a while on helping make quantum technologies happen sooner and for more people. So that's stuff using quantum mechanics across networking, computing, sensing. Um, most relevant for today are I run a nonprofit um, called the Unitary Fund, which helps build public goods and open source technologies in that space, which is really, I think, critical for helping it develop in a positive way as it becomes more geopolitically important and also economically important. Oh, volume? Yeah. <laughs> as yeah. it becomes we're, more we're important. All going to yeah, okay, up, up. And the second thing that I've been thinking about really recently is as we build these technologies, one the applications that you see about in magazines are all the economic benefits. But I actually think probably the most important are going to be how we use them to do new things in fundamental science and to study things in fundamental physics. And there's a couple specific mad science experiments um, that I've been thinking about with some collaborators over the last six months about some stuff we might try and do. So they are mad. If well, yeah. Don't know how to talk about them. I mean, everyone knows quantum mechanics is weird, and like people study. I mean, I've been we're doing it for a long time, and just like every time you look at it, it's weirder than you think. Um, so great. I'm glad I decided to look at it today. Then, um, okay, wonderful. I, I everyone who would like to answer this question it doesn't have to be everyone, but like. I think in this notion of differential technology development, of actually like making specific technologies happen that are security and safety enhancing earlier than the potential threat, uh, threat technologies, do you have any specific areas that you're particularly excited about? I already mentioned, which is mostly me um, parroting Mark Miller, computer security and specifically object capabilities uh, as one potential earlier point, even like 
uh, you know, to, to advance, even in the face like uh, of AI systems and, and the infosec risks there. But do you have any bits and pieces that you can give us in terms of concrete technologies that you're excited about that are security and safety enhancing that may get us there? I'll, I'll say decision markets, but <laughs> they, they could definitely create more accurate policy if they would do some small scale experiments first. Wonderful. And this is maybe a little controversial, but um, I think if we could get crypto to actually work as a, as a money system and have it be independent of governments, it might reduce the risk of war because governments would not be able to print so much money to make wars. Maybe that's naive. There's a couple sci-fi things in quantum tech that could be fun. Um, so if we do switch over to quantum cryptography and it becomes practical, then your proof of security no longer relies on some complexity theoretic assumption. It comes down to how accurately quantum mechanics models the world. Mm -hmm. It's not super practical today, but it would be a good shift if we eventually could get there. And the second is um, there's, there's this thing you can do with quantum computers called blind quantum computing, which is actually a little bit better than um, homomorphic encryption. So in homomorphic encryption, you have some server and I'm a client and I, I want to you know, have the, d the input and output be something that the server doesn't know. Uh, blind quantum computing takes it a little further, where if you have a quantum computer, you can have the input and output not known by the server, but also not what program was run. You just have kind of a space-time bound on what was required in order to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's very hard to build, long-term kind of thing, but the, p the fact that it exists could be nice for computer security. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Anyone else? Also, if you guys want to chime in on each other's answers and like either upvote, downvote, or like uh, um, uh, or, or expand on them, feel free. To, feel free to do so. Like this can be a totally open discussion. Can I add one? Yeah, um, go for it. It's a, this is a little indirect, but I think advances in human longevity indirectly um, help make the world a safer place. I think intrinsically, we all look at our lifespan and go, "All right, what can I get done in this period of time? This is what I got." How, long, well, how big a project can I take on? Uh, and there's a limit, a firm limit. And as you get older, that gets shorter and shorter. And I'm very aware of that, right? But if I had more time, I could take on harder projects. Uh, so, and I would be more ambitious for the future. So I, I, that's one of the reasons I push human longevity. I think it's gonna be a benefit to, to reducing risk. Anyone else would like to say? Well, actually. Actually, what you said actually made me think about um, not just limiting what I want to do to my lifetime, but if I have more faith in institutions and systems, then I can think longer term about the kind of contributions that I make mm -hmm. and also speak louder, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I'll speak up for social science. Yeah. Uh, Whoa, love it. Well, <laughs> often many of these analyses require both a knowledge of technology, what technologies are possible, and some social science analysis of if you sped up that technology, what social scenario happens and why that's better. And I feel that second part is often neglected. You're sort of doing and feel good intuition about, you know, privacy feels good or whatever, but I wanna see a more thorough analysis of these things uh, as a social science analysis to say, tell me exactly why, if this happens faster, that's a good thing. You'd be sticking right into the sacred, Robin. <laughs> Robin, are there historical examples of people who did that analysis about techno technologies that you think are good examples? I haven't seen much. <laughs> That's why I've been trying to show people that it's possible. Anyone else? Anna, Toby, any differential tech inside? I mean, I was thinking more of institution building, which felt like cheating to answer with technology. You know, no, but no, that counts. Science no, that counts. absolutely counts. Absolutely counts. Institution building would be um, my pick, I think. Um, and just, yeah, building better systems mm -hmm. for the, the emerging te technologies that are coming. We'll be hearing on that also from Jessie a little later mm -hmm. uh, with her executions. Uh, well, yeah, well, I mean, my answer would also, uh, also felt to me like cheating at the time, so, uh, but uh, apparently you know, everything's game. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I think, uh, uh, so in terms of differential technology development, if we think very broadly about technology, uh, I think that uh, Carl Sagan, uh, with his uh, metaphor of a race between power and wisdom, uh, for the kind of predicament that humanity's in uh, since the development of the atomic bomb. Uh, I think that that's, that's very powerful. And I think that he, he rightly points out, it's not just that we should stop power um, ever increasing again, uh, but rather that we kind of need to give a boost to wisdom. And it's the kind of relative timing of these things. Do we, at the times when we invent certain technologies, have enough wisdom to actually manage those technologies? 
uh, and there's this exponential increase uh, in a lot of measures of power, uh, but not an exponential increase in, uh, in wisdom. Uh, and uh, a lot of what I'm trying to do is both, is trying to increase the wisdom. Uh, and I think that some people then get a bit confused by this metaphor and they think you're trying to make everyone wise, like we're all kind of you know monks or enlightened <laughs> people or something, yes. what, what's going on? Uh, but but it, it's, I think it, it's more that, that you know, that there's a bunch of things going on. One is uh, cooperative things. And so I, I was impressed by, by the, these ideas you had earlier of uh, actual technologies for um, aggregating information uh, and, uh, and, and ideas and insights in, in good ways. Uh, so collective wisdom is, I think, a big part of it. Also in terms of uh, kind of distilled wisdom. Uh, so, so these ideas, for example, about existential risk uh, as like a key issue of our time, uh, to the I think that that is a, is a wise point uh, that everything is at stake over the long-term future uh, and that uh, both better developing conceptualizing these things at the, at the cutting edge, but also disseminating them out to, uh, uh, out to say, political representatives and also uh, places like the United Nations. And there's actually, you know, surprisingly much interest from, from both politicians and also the UN on, on these ideas at the moment. So I think that that's, that's quite hopeful. That certainly is. Um, wonderful. Well, thanks. We have a few good ideas here. And I also know Jake Sweat, who's over there, is also working on differential tech development, especially for biotech. So you should absolutely go and talk to him about it. Um, and I think a few more folks that are also here are specifically working on this too. We have one over here. Um, and so I think this just has become more of a thing recently. And I just encourage you to really think uh, along those lines. I think it's a really useful exercise uh, where you can think positively about technologies you want to uh, advance first. Okay, let's see if we can do a rapid fire round with a few questions that I have for you. And again, if you want to follow up on my question with anyone, just feel free to do so. This can be like an extremely collaborative space. Um, and usually my algorithm uh, when I host seminars is like, you can stop me from talking by talking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I'll start with you, Toby. Um, you know, because you prompted this whole existential hope uh, kind of like movement or like, you know, at least like interest area uh, by writing this book and so uh, by writing the paper on existential hope. It's very short. I really recommend everyone to read it. Beatrice will be introducing a few more terms about that, like you catastrophe and so forth later. Um, but I, yeah, just really wanted to see like what inspired you to write this paper on existential hope? What is the technical definition of existential hope? And how have your views changed perhaps like since writing it? Yeah, okay. Uh, so. Uh, it was uh, discussions with, with Owen Cotton Barrett and I and uh, about uh, existential risk. Uh, Nick Bostrom's understanding of existential risk was to take the idea of extinction risk and notice there's some things that are similarly bad um, that have like a lot of these really distinctive points about extinction risk have, that have it in common, where we don't really care whether an AI permanently disempowers humanity and there are seven people left, which, you know, in its kind of to do experiments on versus a world where there's no people left. They're, they're, they're very similar in a lot of ways. And um, uh, we don't need to know which one is going to happen in order to know kind of how much risk there is. Uh, so that was Bostrom's idea. And that was based on uh, the idea of thinking about humanity's long-term potential. Uh, and that there are certain things like extinction uh, which could greatly lower that potential. So it's the, the ceiling on how high we can go comes crashing down and you know, can't be raised again. And maybe a totalitarian future of certain forms could also be like that. Uh, and so. Uh, but this idea of potential was a bit wishy-washy, and we, we were a bit suspicious of it. So we were thinking about other ways of trying to make that clear. And we hit upon a way where instead of it being a, an existential risk being a probability of a lowering of potential, um, it could be a, a, a chance or you know, a probability that the expected value of the long-term future of humanity comes crashing down. And, and expected value is a better understood concept. Uh, although it's still probabilities of probabilities going on, right? It's, it's still a bit, you know, it's, but it has to be a bit uh, uh, meta. Um, and, but we thought we'd reduce it to something maybe that was a bit, a bit better understood. So you can think of it like a familiar area is stock markets, uh, where the stock price is meant to be some kind of uh, net present value of the expected future, uh, like profits or something of, of this company over all time until it, until it ends. And uh, so you could think of a similar kind of a, you know, a ticker price or something for, for the, the, you know, this is a bit of a profane example, but of the, uh, the long-term future value of humanity. Uh, and that there are certain things which existential risks would be the crashing, like the, the, the possibility that it crashes down to a very low level. That would be an existential catastrophe um, on, on this description. Uh, but maybe that, that, that kind of opened up this possibility. Well, what if it, if it, if it does the opposite of crashing down and, uh, and just leaps up to some much higher area where it then stably stays up there? 
Uh, and so that became, th this dual became more, more possible um, or more thinkable under that framework. Uh, and so we, we called that existential hope uh, as the opposite of existential risk. So th this probability or the chance that it jumps up. Uh, and then we didn't have a great term for, for the actual event. We called it existential catastrophe was the dropping down. And when we went with this term that, uh, that uh, Tolkien uh, developed uh, called a U catastrophe, EU, like uh, uh, prefix, although now it sounds a bit like YouTube or something. I noticed uh, that if you're having a, a verbal conversation, it's actually hard to talk about. Um, uh, and uh, that uh, this, this possibility of things uh, jumping up. And so that was, that, that was the, the idea. Uh, ultimately, you know, when, when writing The Precipice, I actually decided that I think the potential-based definition is actually slightly better, uh, although I'm not, still not sure. They're, they're both, they, they illuminate different things. Uh, but it, it makes it more clear why it is that, that you can never get back. Um, and if you can never get back, there's a whole lot of very distinctive methodological things about studying the field. For example, that humanity must get through all of its future without ever once falling victim to one of these things. Uh, whereas if it's a kind of stock market crash type thing, well, maybe you can kind of come back up after that. And so some of the methodology is a little bit less clearer and so on. Uh, so that's one kind of development that I've got a bit back on that. Nice. Uh, and then recently, I guess this will take some, exp I won't explain this now, but I'll just kind of leave you with it really. But in terms of uh, thinking about the, the expected value of the future, uh, my current uh, un like understanding of that is that it's infinite. Um, and uh, I was thinking about a bunch of this recently about thinking about very long-term trajectories of humanity and also probability distributions. Uh, it's kind of a well-known fact that, that there are some probability distributions that have sufficiently high chances of sufficiently good outcomes, that even if it's guaranteed to be finite, uh, that the expected value is infinite. Doesn't that mean we could crash it by a factor of a thousand and it would still be infinite? Yeah, so, 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 so one reason that, <laughs> that, that this, I think the idea of the infinite in the long-term future, um, Thomas uh, Moynihan has great uh, analysis of this actually, has been a stumbling block and it's actually made people think quite badly about the long-term future uh, because of this type of idea that if it's infinite, we've got this kind of cosmic nonchalance of whatever we do, it stays infinite. Um, but there, there are, that, that's only true for certain uh, mathematical understandings of the infinite, uh, such as the extended reals. Uh, if you use something like the hyperreal numbers, uh, then half of infinity is, is, you know, is half the size of infinity. Uh, and so, uh, and I have had a look at trying to get this to work, and it seems like you can get it all to work. Uh, you just needed a, you know, the fourth most common mathematical understanding of the infinite instead of the first three don't work. Uh, and once you do that, you made it through. once you do that, actually, it all seems to work such that uh, you can have kind of infinite expectations and not be paralyzed in some way with it. Also, oh, infinite um, ethics is not really a thing then. But like the problems of infinite ethics wouldn't be a thing then anymore. The, some of them are, some of them aren't. Uh, so this solves this solves part of those those challenges. But I I I, I, I hesitate yeah. to say all this. I mention it because in terms of like hope for the future, uh, it was kind of interesting when I was looking at this and I was like, actually, I think it's not just because of an idea that there's some chance no matter how small that it's infinite, so therefore the expected value is infinite. Even if you set that aside, I still think actually uh, it's higher than any finite number uh, and that there is a systematic way of talking about it and that if, if you were to have a 50% chance that you lose it all, that would be infinitely bad under this scenario. Um, so. Can't possibly explain it all in a few seconds here, but uh, feel free to ask me. Yeah, in the 20 minute break, I'm sure you get all <laughs> through of these. Yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe like more from a kind of like personal angle, like uh, what like really flipped me into this more like exo framing was like uh, also finding foresight on the internet. Like I remember I was at the LSE and like I was like, you know, pretty like do me about AI. Like I wrote like my, my thesis on on AI safety, and I just Googled everything possible about like it was mostly sequences and stuff at the time. Um, and then I found foresight on the internet. And I was like, what is this organization? Um, and uh, and I think that like one thing that really drew me to it was all of these old school photos from Vision Weekends, where like I don't know, like people <laughs> just like like Eric Drexler, you guys all like um, still brand. You guys had such a blast, and like it looked really like there was so much optimism back then about the long term future. And like you as having been around, you know, like really since its inception, I'm just super curious. You've seen so many ups and downs with like molecular nanotechnology having a big boom, then like the whole great, like uh, the great goo big uh, thing happening, then the term being co-opted uh, to some extent, similar things happening with AI as well. Like how has your kind of like optimistic like taste changed over the years, if at all? Like, you know, you've seen so many different technological developments, like how has it been going for you since, since then? 
Yeah, uh, good point. Well, those of you who've been in this area for a long time uh, know the famous saying, something like, never mistake a clear vision for a short distance. <laughs> in other words, just because you have a clear technological vision doesn't mean that it's going to be developed in the time frame that you think it's going to happen in, right? Th things take longer. But there's a, there's a corollary to that that is also true, which is never mistake a technological winter for a permanent slowdown, right? I mean, those of you who've been paying attention to AI for a few decades know that there was a very long winter. And one of the, one of the things that we knew wasn't going to work was neural networks, remember? And that changed, suddenly that changed. And suddenly a technology that we thought wasn't going to work, suddenly, boom, is taking over the world now. So you can be surprised in the other direction too. Um, so uh, as we think about existential risk, especially existential risk from AI, um, I would just want to remind you that, uh, I'll do an analogy, when you're on the highway and your car breaks down and you pull over to the side, you're in a dangerous situation, and the reason is that as drivers drive, they tend to steer in the direction they're looking, which means they look at you, you're pulled over, boom, they hit you, right? Mm -hmm. That's why that happens so often. So we have to remember when we're thinking about AI risk, don't just think of the downside scenarios, right? Let's come up with some positive scenarios and aim in those directions, and I think we're going to be doing that later today. So, no pressure on you guys. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> We just want you to save the world. We're going to do this afternoon. You'll be out of here by, you know, five or eight, depending on how long you're staying. It's great. <laughs> Good. No pressure. Really, really no pressure in that regard. Um, like Anna, like I think you also had this like really wonderful existential project um, um, going on like last year with uh, Future of Life Institute. They did an AI world building contest. Who here knows about the contest or has read some of the submissions? Has submitted something maybe even? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, wonderful, wonderful project. I was really lucky to be one of the judges there. I would love to like have you a bit explain about like some of the positive world builds that came out or something. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 for anyone else, mm -hmm. like big uh, like invitation to check out those world builds. Mm -hmm. They were ex absolutely wonderful. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and if you guys are curious, come talk to me. I can show you some like some interesting data about it too, and like some fun slides about how different the, the worlds were. Um, so we had 144 submissions, and people had to from all over the world and people had to imagine the future in 2045 where things did not go horribly wrong not a utopia but just things didn't go horribly wrong and we had agi uh, and try to imagine a lot of detail of the path to get there and we had people submit detailed uh, timelines short stories art and answers to a lot of very uh, nitty-gritty questions about this world and what it looks like and we were pretty blown away by, by the submissions um, we're currently interviewing the top eight teams in a mini series, uh, podcast mini series, and every single world is so different. Every single conversation is so different, but um, you know, some of them lean really hard into you know governance, uh, the evolution of governance and institution building, and all all these kind of societal tools. Uh, other ones had um, just amazing narrative and longevity featured strongly in the in the top world. Uh, and how that, and all the kind of societal trickle down effects of, you know, being able to live forever or extending lifespan. Um, there are topics around, oh man, um, one of the worlds, which was like fantastic sci fi, we develop an ability to communicate with animals, and suddenly that completely transforms people's perception of the natural world and even like their relationships with one another. That would like, from a story perspective, Storytelling perspective, that one was amazing. There was another where, because of the rising ocean floors, you know, you have this strong lean into these digital nations and a lot of lost territory um, leads to transformations and yeah, kind of geop geo geopolitics. So all, a lot of them were really imaginative, imaginative very uh, detailed. And I think there's also an element of this where I think we have to make a bit, we have to push to bring some positive visions into the mainstream media to challenge a bit all these dystopian depictions of the future. Because if that's all the average person is seeing, like the future is grim, is even if they know nothing about AGI or all the other risks we worry about in this room, you have to wonder what does that do to us, uh, to our worldview as, as, as a society. 
So I think there's an element of, we certainly want to depict some uh, positive paths that we can steer towards, but there's also an important conversation that needs to happen, like uh, creating a, a diverse um, discussion about what, what kind of futures people want or don't want and make that inclusive. Yeah. So, well, what do you think is the motivating factor? Because like when there was the industrial revolution, people were speaking about progress. If you look mm -hmm. at Google now, that mm -hmm. word has almost disappeared from, from mm -hmm. the vocabulary. So what, what can we provide to people so that they get excited about the future? They can see the value that is coming in. Uh, to me, storytelling is the, the most uh, the most clear path to that and like actually showing them visions and like showing visions in popular media might inspire people to work on these things as opposed to telling them how like all the ways things could go wrong, you might feel quite powerless. So I think um, storytelling is undervalued and storytelling really shapes culture um, and culture does shape the future quite a bit. So I think this is this is under an underappreciated part of what we do. Maybe we can have an exo yeah. meme contingent here yeah. later. <laughs> I see a few heads already nodding. Um, yeah, thank you. I think, you know, like uh, the world building was really interesting because I had like, you know, the time was, I think, 2040, right, for this. And um, I think that one interesting bit for this is just the AI timeline debate in general. And I know that like you, Robin, and Eliezer rubbed shoulders on the AI foom debate. <laughs> Who here is aware of the early AI foom debate um, from the good old days? Um, and yeah, I'm just super curious, like have your timelines uh, updated drastically to uh, like uh, a more near term, harder takeoff? Or are you still holding on to, it's gonna be gradual, it's gonna be slow? Um, over the last century or even two, uh, we've repeatedly had these situations where new basically AI demos have just really impressed people. Uh, and this didn't just happen the last few years, this has happened decade after decade. It's just very repeated that we've had very impressive demos and people at the time said, oh my God, wow. And almost every time basically people said, are we almost there? Uh, that, that was not just true 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it was true in the 1980s when I left grad school to go off to join AI before it was all done, because <laughs> that's what the press was saying at the time, and I bought it as a you know 20 something. Uh, in the 1960s, there was a presidential commission <laughs> on automation and would it take all the jobs soon. In the 1930s, there was very concern. In the 1830s, in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, there was top economists discussing, in fact, whether the jobs would all be taken soon by automation. <laughs> so we just clearly find it hard to judge that distance. <laughs> Basically, when we see a next impressive demo, we go, could we almost be there? And every time so far, it's turned out, no, we weren't really close. <laughs> and so that's what I got to go with my prior for the moment. <laughs> it feels like that again, right? Look at this thing. It feels like it's close, but we're just really bad at looking at that distance. So I got to go with the prior here and say, it's probably still a long way off. Anyone want to contradict him here <laughs> in the room? Every time I've been offered life insurance, I haven't needed it yet, and yeah. I still don't need it. <laughs> right, so the, you could say there's a small chance, and you should be prepared for that small chance, but then we're going to talk about what is the thing you have a small chance of. So I'm pretty skeptical about the extreme FOOM scenario, that there'll be this one system that will jump ahead of all the ones at a sudden thing, and it will have values that will sort of, in effect, evolve quickly over time, and those values will be terrible, and the net effect of all those assumptions and the net effect of all those assumptions is terrible outcome. You have to ask, you know, how many probabilities you're multiplying there. But then the more fundamental question you have to ask is, I could devote resources to deal with those problems now or later. If I devote to them later, I'll know a lot more and compound interest will have a lot more resources. Is this, what, what fraction of our effort should we be putting in now? And I think it's not really the right time because we just don't understand the kind of system we're dealing with. In the past, almost every system you ever learn to deal with, you learn to deal with it because you had relatively concrete versions of them <laughs> in front of you to see the problems and deal with. And thinking in the abstract about, say, nuclear weapons in the year 1500 <laughs> or even tanks would just, you couldn't have got very far because you just didn't have very concrete versions in front of you. So I'd say mostly we should wait to, you know, look at concrete systems and deal with their problems and deal with them uh, when, you know, when the time is right. Um, this is a question partly for Robin, but for the whole panel. Um, 
Eric Drexler wrote this paper, Reframing Superintelligence, which I thought was very interesting in, in separating the competency from agency. And yet, most discussions still don't seem to make that distinction. And I wondered what your thoughts were on that. I, you should also talk to Davidat over there, who is collaborating with Eric Drex on the Open Agency Architecture, uh, which recently came right. out three days ago, and he wrote about it a little longer ago, and it seems to be like an evolution of reframing superintelligence, maybe? I mean, I, I agree that one of the key assumptions of the concerned scenario is you have a system that becomes agentic, and that's just one of the probabilities you have to add into, the, multiply into the overall scenario, and most systems we're making today aren't like that, and the scenario, the claim is somehow systems will inevitably or like out of our control or even in hidden lying to us way become agentic. Uh, that's just part of the scenario you're creating and I think we should be somewhat skeptical about that. Thank you. Will, do you maybe want to, oh no, Toby, you had. Well, just on, on, on that one. Go I mean, for it. If there was only one AI, it. then that would make sense. If there's a whole lot and if any of them are agentic, then you, you're screwed. Then it's a, the probability thing works a bit differently because you have to be. Well, it the, depends on whether any one of them being bad is I the agree. problem. I mean, if you have one bad out of a thousand good, uh, you know, why would the one bad beat uh, all the thousand uh, good? I agree. And, and, and to, the, to the general question, I, I think uh, it being an agent, certainly the, the, the key kind of classic scenarios of AI existential risk are about it being an agent, an agent who uh, uh, chooses actions based on the consequences of those actions, that has a low discount rate such that it's prepared to do fairly drastic things over years in order to uh, achieve much bigger benefits. There's a, there's a whole bunch of assumptions that generally get built in and trying to block those assumptions uh, does seem to be a reasonable path to try to uh, uh, make things safer. Uh, and uh, another one is kind of general intelligence and part of uh, uh, Eric's idea was to, uh, to have a general, a system that is general, but where each component of it is only more narrowly intelligent uh, as a way of trying to block this, and I think that that was a good idea. Uh, and so there definitely, I, I think with Christine's comment earlier about steering into the thing that you're looking at, uh, there was a bit of that with regard to um, a agent systems. Uh, and I think that it's, uh, it's good that the, the thing that's currently doing very well in AI is not itself most naturally an agent. Um, albeit one can kind of agentify it. Uh, I, or is I it self-improving? Yeah. I would vote for the two of you standing next to each other when we head out <laughs> so that people can, uh, can get into a bit of a debate. And maybe, Will, you close, that out, uh, you close us out with any thoughts you have on quantum computing and AGI. Anything come to mind? Actually, I'll, maybe I'll say something related, so, uh, but not that question. <laughs> um. <laughs> Fine. You make up what you want. OK, so one thing that I've been wondering about, and it would be fun to talk to people here who maybe have some input, is um, what happens if the multiverse interpretation of quantum mechanics is definitely what's going on? How does that change how we think about existential risk, existential hope, ethics, where those other universes are real, but not in the specifically philosophical sense, in like a really physics, physical sense? Um, maybe I'll leave that as a question. <laughs> Great. So yeah. you know now who to find and hunt down, maybe after they've gotten a chance to get themselves a glass of water or coffee. But this concludes the first set of, um, uh, of chats. I'm hoping that it sparked some interesting bits that you may want to explore in the scenario building later. I can't thank you guys enough for joining. I know that we've just tiptoed around a few topics, but as we kind of go and percolate through the day, I'm hoping that they get brought up over and over again. So this is just an appetizer for what you can then uh, be discussing over the break. And so now you have like around 20 minutes and then we'll come in back for the second round of fireside chats. Thank you so, so much. This was wonderful.